Good afternoon, everyone. How are we? Still have a little bit of room in the brain to, to absorb what we're going to discuss for the next hour? Yes. Great, thank you. All right, so for those of you who might have heard me yesterday, I mean, what we're going to be discussing today is, is something that really matters for me and the gold standard. And it is how do we bring bigger impact for small producers, local communities, and how do we maximize benefit for those who are actually delivering impact on the ground. And today I'm so honored to have the panelists with me. And, and these four panelists do things that really, really inspire me in my job. So I'm very excited to actually not to moderate, but actually listen to what they're doing and learn from them. So I have Laura Safraz here today with us, who is the founder and CEO of Net Zero Ag. We have Faisal, Senior Director of Innovative Finance at Clean Cooking Alliance, Nira, Director at Fly Fair Climate Fund, and Paul, Director of Sales and Marketing at CO2 Balance. So I'm not going to set the scene because I want to use the, the 50 minutes we have to really dive into all the discussions we want to cover today. So Laura Safras, great to have you here. And I know you want to engage with the panelists and, and the audience, so be aware. Um, so at, at Net Zero Ag, you're working with big international corporations like Mars Food. Uh, you also work with re researchers like the International Rice Research Institute and smallholder farmers in Pakistan. Tell us a little bit about your work and, and what you want to achieve. Well, thank you so much for, for having me in the after lunch session. We need to get people a bit energized. So I tell you, I think the, the single most exciting opportunity for everyone in this room, including all of you, is focusing on the needs of smallholder farmers. And, and that's what we've been doing for the last 10 years in, in, in India, Pakistan, Vietnam, Cambodia. Uh, you, you can drive around Thailand, like many of you may have, may have done, and see these beautiful rice paddies, right? Uh, with, with water standing in them. And if you go close enough and you can get in them, you'll see little bubbles of water coming out of them. That's pure methane being, being released. And look, smallholder farmers, particularly rice farmers in Asia, they feed the world. They feed everyone. They feed themselves. They, they produce the main calorific intake um, for hundreds of millions of folks every day in Asia. And they're at the forefront of climate change, but they're also emitters of, of methane. And so our entire focus is to try and connect the voluntary markets with smallholder farmers. Uh, when you drive through Thailand, You'll meet lots of folks involved in the voluntary market, consultants, auditors, investors, entrepreneurs, everyone. But you ask a smallholder farmer if they've received a dollar of income, they haven't. Right? And so that's what we're focusing on and, and uh, doing it with a lot of enthusiasm. You know, by the way, so I'm a parliamentarian, and I tell you, this gives me more satisfaction than anything else I do. Mm. <laughs> Great. So in that, in that project or in those initiatives that you're, you're leading, how are you ensuring that the smallholder farmers, producers, are incentivized to change their behaviors? Yeah. And how do you ensure that those incentives actually stay with them during that change management process? Yeah, so, so um, the, the, the methodologies available today are completely out of date and not fit for, for purpose, right? And, and I appreciate what you're doing at Gold Standard, addressing that and updating these methodologies. Uh, what we do is we use a lot of tech, a whole lot of tech, and that's our sort of, you know, uh, our, our unique thing. So we've designed our own sensors, low-cost sensors. We stick in the ground to be able to measure the water levels. Um, we've done a lot of satellite work, so we have a dedicated satellite team that we've hired that just reviews satellite data to try and monitor at scale the, the changes that farmers are making. Um, and look, if, if you're selling a credit for any amount of money, five, 10, 15, 20 dollars, whatever, you know, that is a major source of income for smallholder farmers. It, it might not be for a potato farmer in Idaho, but for a rice farmer in India, it's, it's, it's very, very meaningful. So, so we're focused on applying tech across smallholders to make the voluntary markets 
accessible for them and to work for them. And also, I have to say, I think they should be more involved, smallholders, in building the methodologies, in, in being part of the discussion. I mean, how many folks here are smallholder farmers from Asia? Exactly, zilch, nada. And so we need more engagement from, from them as well. We can't just show up with this thick methodology, which is really hard to understand. I can barely understand it. And you tell them this is what you gotta do, and you get a credit. Yeah? So, so, so I think they need to be much more engaged. And they, uh, anyways. No, I, I mean, this is, I, I have a bit of a guilty face uh, uh, here because we've been discussing this for quite some time at Gold Standard. How do we get the actual voices of smallholder uh, producers and farmers and, and bring those learnings and, and context into methodology development and, and MRV development, design of it, because it, it's very different. So, and we rarely hear from them. We do hear from many of our project developers who are working directly with them, but we don't have enough presence uh, from them and voice in the development of gold standards processes and, and methodologies. So that's a, I, I, I take that point very seriously and, and take that away. I think everyone needs, a, everyone needs a smallholder strategy. It's what's gonna save the voluntary markets. Good to, good to hear from you. All right, then let's, let's hear from Faisal. Um, what are, because during the whole conference, day one and, and part of day two, we are hearing a lot about clean cooking and the community services, and you are leading your way. Um, what are the most distinctive opportunities and pressing challenges around bringing that clean cooking to these countries and communities? and and what sort of the challenges around securing that big impact? Um, Can you hear? Yeah, that's brilliant. Okay. Um, I think a little bit of fun fact to start with. Um, how many of you know, I mean, how many of you are sort of interested in natural history? Some people, okay. So you would probably know this, that Probably the most important first step in humanity was the invention of fire and the use of that fire for cooking because it freed up time for people from foraging and digesting food to expanding your brains, right? So that's the sort of origins of what we know as human beings as we are today. What's interesting is that over the last, since 700,000 years ago, technological progress, advancement of markets and so on, Despite all of these things, about 2.3 billion people, for them, life, time has stood still. Nothing's changed because they continue to use those methods that was used when fire was invented and people use that to cook, right? And just to put it into perspective, some of you, or many of you would know this, but that's amounting to about the total population globally in 1940. So imagine in 1940, all the people still using this, that's basically what it is. And if we think around current trends, if we continue, we're gonna look at about 1.9 billion people still not having access. That's equivalent to the global population in 1920, right? So the fundamental case for clean cooking is very clear from a human perspective, DNA, but it's also very important that how can we have a world where everything is progress except for 2.3 billion people. So for us, we think what's really important was how do we make the advancement of market and technology for people who've been denied, right? So that to us is a solution. We don't think it's gonna be about charity, but it's gonna be about markets working for them. Uh, the challenge is that the traditional models of getting people access to markets, which is using a bit of grants <coughs> and hoping that somehow investment will flow through, just hasn't worked. But what's the big difference right now is that we see carbon, particularly carbon finance, is totally revolutionizing the ability of companies to become viable very quickly mm -hmm. because they're able to really reduce the prices of products to a point where very poor people, the small farmers that you're talking about, are able to buy and use, right? So we think that that's a really important piece. But we do think that in order for that to work, there is a bunch of risks that are available in the clean cooking market. 
which we've got to solve collectively. I think many of these issues have already come through. I think the most dominant one, you've talked about a lot of surprise, which was around standards, right? Although you talked about it as complex, but effectively buyers have real confidence issues because they are too many standards, too variable, and they don't know what's, what needs. So we need to be able to have greater integrity and trust in what's being produced, right? Um, the second is, and it came along a little bit, which is about how do you have um, sort of shared risks and benefits across the value chain. Right now we have a black box where nobody knows, except for those who are developing, where the money actually goes. Does it go to the community? Does it go to the project developers? Does it go to the companies? Does it go to, uh, where does it go? Nobody knows. So I think we need greater transparency and much greater sort of agreement around what is the appropriate level of risk and reward sharing across the value chain. The third we think that's really important is just additionality because ultimately for us, it's not necessarily carbon markets per se, but it's what happens with people who are denied clean cooking. So we need to be able to, and there is a limit to when carbon finance will be available for clean cooking uh, as removals and others take over. Uh, so we have this very short window of opportunity and we've got to have to be able to use that as a way of helping companies to become viable so that they can start looking at other forms of finance so that they can continue mm -hmm. growing. And then finally, we've got to, and again, Lord Sofraz will know the language about for the many and not the few uh, in British politics, but it's weird that right now, currently in the market, only a few handful of companies are able to benefit from carbon finance. So you're creating an unlevel playing field. Mm -hmm. So we've got to figure out how we create open market access for companies so that everyone can play in the market. And we have a market that's filled with many players giving diversity and choice to people who need clean cooking solutions. Um, so I'll just stop there. Thank you. Um, how is Clean Cooking Alliance sort of working to address some of these risks? Could you give some examples of how you're playing the, mm. the role? So I think John mentioned this on the first day where we've got two pieces of work around integrity and fairness in all of those areas. Mm -hmm. One is around the work of the 4C work on methodology so that the, we have consistency across the board, across all the standard setters. Um, and that's now being combined with our work around responsible carbon finance for clean cooking initiatives. Some of you will have heard this where we've got working groups really discussing the issue of integrity, fairness, additionality and market access. And then we're working towards, including with Gold, Gold Standard and others, many of you are here, so that we can come with some uh, level of norms and a roadmap for clean cooking and then, then tie it up with established other initiatives like ICBCM and so on. So that's, these are two on the integrity side. And then on the, uh, the market development side, we have kind of three major areas that we focus on. One is how do you drive down costs by, for example, using digital technologies. Yeah. We just completed a, uh, a boot camp of companies from the digital side, on the data side, to look at how we can use that innovation to drive change within the clean cooking market. Uh, the second is creation of a global platform that brings together impact investors, guarantee funds, local banks, uh, uh, as well as carbon developers together so that collectively we can align our uh, work and generate finance and risk share across the board. Mm -hmm. Because I think currently we have real silos in how these things are done and we need to be able to sort of risk share that work. Um, and then finally, I think we've got to real collectively have a, have a responsibility to communicate well. Um, and I don't think we do enough communication around both to potential critics, but also funders, because we do need the mix of public funding, commercial funding, blended finance, all of these things to come together uh, to support uh, the carbon markets, but also to help it transition away mm -hmm. into more traditional forms of financing. Guys, don't listen to him. Don't waste time on cook stoves. Focus on small holders. You thank me for it, I promise you. <laughs> Great. Trust the politicians. 
<laughs> All right. No, I, I think there's a there's an emerging theme in in what Laura Safra said and what what you're also introducing. You know the the need for digital tools to enhance that transparency and that trust, bring the cost down, especially for smallholders and 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 households that are using uh, clean cooking solutions. And what you said really struck me is shared benefits. So that one is something that, that we're really interested in tackling because I think some of the, the, the key elements of building trust in the market is are we actually delivering maximized benefits to the impact agents who are delivering the impact? And I think the next panelist will probably have lots of experience doing that because you've been leading your way with um, NERA, with Cli uh, Fair Climate Fund. So you developed multiple projects um, under the Fair Trade Climate Standard. And can you share with us a little bit of your ex experience and examples of how you deliver that and how you delivered on the societal outcomes to maximize the benefit that's reaching the communities? Yeah, thank you. I'm very inspired this conference by the fact that it's inclusive social impact is so much on the agenda. So thank you for that. And I want to make a bridge between you two <laughs> because every farmer is also a cook. No, I'm, there is a cook, a wife in every <laughs> farmer's household. So it's almost the same population you're talking exactly. about. Our farmers I, will earn so much money. They won't need any stoves. They'll have the state of the art. Oh, ovens. then we don't need to have them in the carbon market. No, I, I just want to start with some uh, notes of Ivo de Boer this morning, uh, why the voluntary carbon markets came into existence. And that was partly because you could make a more uh, economic uh, carbon reduction. The cost of it is less than if you invest in a, a high cost filter in the, in the north. But also the fact that there is a transition needed for um, access to, to energy supplies, to technology in low income countries. That is, has been the basics of the voluntary carbon markets. So that means that you need to focus on the people that are most vulnerable to the, the impact of climate change. And that's actually in the core of our mission. We use the carbon markets to benefit people that are most impacted by climate change, be it farmers, households, it could be any person having the impacts of our carbon emissions. Uh, because basically it's a climate injustice issue we are emitting a lot of carbon and people that don't emit, they suffer most of the problems of it. So we are Fair Climate Fund. Um, in 2009, we established um, our, our entity using carbon markets in a fair and inclusive manner. And the Fair Trade Climate Standard is actually made together with Fair Trade International to um, use the same principles as with the banana. Who, who of you knows the Fair Trade Climate Standard? Can I see some hands? Okay, like 10, 15. Now, because the bananas and the, and the fair trade uh, logo is very well known overall. I mean that I know the market uh, knowledge about it is very high, but for carbon it's still very low. But let me explain a little bit about the background of carbon, the fair trade climate standard. It is actually based on the same principles as the banana. So you, what we do is we pay a minimum price for a carbon credit which means, and we consider the household, the farmer, who is reducing the carbon as the owner of the credit. So there is no discussion about who owns about the income of the carbon income. It needs to be with the producer, who is the household, with the clean cook stove, or the farmer reducing the methane emission. So the, the ownership is, is key. So that is one of the components of the Fair Trade Climate Standard. The second one, is that we pay the minimum price and that we pay a premium based on delivery of the carbon credits. And why a premium? A premium is paid for adaptation <coughs> measures. So what we say that, that mitigation is also paying for adaptation. So adaptation means planting trees, reforestation, because the cook still needs firewood. I mean, it's not reduced to zero with an improved stove. So you still need to, to make the, the forest uh, replanted around the, the, the livelihoods. And we actually want to, to build on that premium also to engage, for example, biodiversity improvement. So 
I think we can build in, in our fair trade carbon credit, also other uh, premium uh, for landscape restoration. So that is the third point. The fourth point of the fair trade climate standard is capacity building. I mean, the rollout of stove, just giving it to someone and, uh, and, and don't look after it and not knowing how to implement it is just not generating true carbon reductions, I'm sure. So you need to train uh, the households, the women, everyone around it to uh, become knowledgeable how to, to use the stove and how to use also the premium. And the fourth, the fifth point of the fair trade climate standard is actually a, a reduction plan. Our buyers need to make a, a, a robust uh, reduction plan in their carbon emissions uh, when they purchase more than 1,000 tons for themselves as end users. So they also have responsibility to reduce their carbon emissions. So the fair trade climate standard came into existence in 2015 and, and we implemented, like you say, and we're actually now building a, a, a platform in which we want to have a certain share of the carbon revenue that we earn to flow back to the households with a, a blockchain-based platform in order to make it uh, an incentive to keep on cooking on the clean device and in order to keep on using the clean cook stove. So we try to uh, reduce the cost eh, and therefore the digitization from the gold standard is also a good point. But by making it more efficient, you can also bring more money to the, to the producer of the cook stoves. And um, the, the last, um, the, the income generating capacity of households is one of the SDGs that is often overlooked, the financial flows. We talk about benefits of time savings, all the other benefits which are definitely there, huh? but financial income, we often don't want mm -hmm to talk about. And I think for gold standard, we have a sort of objective that 50% of our carbon project cost needs to go to the households. And I would like to have the gold standard more transparent about the benefit sharing of the carbon income. That would for me also be a very good point to see where is the, you mentioned it, huh? the financial flows, where does the money flow? It's very intransparent. And Especially when the markets grow, there is a lot of money to gain for the households who produce the carbon reductions. No, that's, that's interesting. Um, I, I, I wanted to have a follow-up question on the benefit sharing, but you, you talked about the financial income flow and transparency around it. So I, we, we've been thinking about this, and, and it'll be great if, if we can also get some reactions from the audience later, but what, what we can control as a standard only start somewhere and stop somewhere. So how do we, as a community around this room, can work towards that price, like financial flow transparency? It's gonna be an interesting one. And there's a running theme around digitization and capacity building, and I'm trying to link between what Laura Sefra said earlier about engaging the communities, the, the smallholders in methodology development, in designing MRV, and that, is a natural step towards capacity building because they're involved in designing it and therefore delivering that will be naturally built into the whole process. So mm -hmm. these are the things that we're thinking about, but um, I'm gonna come back to that financial flow point and, and pass it over to the audience mm -hmm. to help me answer that one. So last one, um, Paul. So. CO2 Balance was one of the very first project developers who, who issued carbon credits, gold standard carbon credits, with additional gender responsive uh, certification, the requirements. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and what that actually delivered on the ground? Yeah, of course, thanks. Um, so yeah, we were the, the first to put the project under the additional um, standard. Um, that was our Uganda Safe Water Project, where we identified broken boreholes um, and then fixed them and provided ongoing maintenance to ensure uh, a safe, clean water for communities. And that reduced the need to boil it, and there's the carbon saving. Um, we always knew that there was a, a, a gender benefit uh, because the burden of uh, collecting wood and gathering water fell to, to the women primarily. Uh, but this new certification allowed us to really demonstrate that and confirm it to buyers that there is actually a, a gender balance uh, within that. 
Um, so we could demonstrate that there was time saved and that time went to a certain activity such as uh, the farming and, uh, and other activities, um, including a uh, reduction of uh, gender-based violence as well, uh, which was an often uh, an issue in rural parts of, uh, of Uganda when women are out on their own collecting uh, water and wood. So it was great to be able to, to demonstrate the benefits of that. Um, but what the, the putting this through the, our project through this uh, additional methodology, which when we spoke to our projects team and said, "Good news, guys! You know that water meth. We now need to put it through a gender meth as well," and they weren't too enthused to start with <laughs> double meth. Um, but it was it's proved really popular with both the team and also uh, the, the people um, who we speak to uh, in Uganda. Uh, what we've um, we found that when you follow the methodology, you have to go above and beyond what you would normally do. Um, so that is focusing a lot more work on your um, on your local stakeholder consultation, where we brought in a, uh, a gender expert, um, dedicated workshops, um, speaking with uh, separately focus groups with the women to make sure that they get their say, get their input, um, as well as all the, the monitoring that goes with that. Um, but the interesting thing we found um, was that putting the project through this gender methodology was a, a start of a behavioural change within the community um, in a positive way. So the actual certification helped to deepen the impact that the project was delivering, um, uh, based around, it, not just about balancing out the representation on the water resource committees to more of a 50-50 split, but it found that uh, women felt that they were being heard um, men started to uh, hear more. It's a very male-dominated uh, uh, culture in some of these rural parts of Africa. So it, it, it was it really lovely to see that the standard, the certification, was helping to drive the impact uh, around behavioural change of women having a voice and, and being heard. And this is this is heartwarming. <laughs> uh, uh uh, statement coming from uh, our own project developer because that's exactly what it's intended to do that we want to change that behavior along the way and and that's just great to hear o on that note do you see these sort of additional certification or or SDG impact um, growing in the market that we're in today do you where you from where you sit do you see investors uh, uh, more and more increasingly interested in investing in those co-benefits or impact, uh, verified impact in addition to carbon? Yeah, I mean, we've always focused on like high impact um, rural based um, projects and that's kind of the heart of what we, what we always deliver. What we have seen in the past 12, 18 months is um, an, an increased appetite for going further um, with uh, clients wanting us to deliver additional benefits on top of the either the clean cooking or, or the safe water projects. Um, and so getting that through some kind of co-benefit certification will be excellent. Um, we have developed a new concept called Carbon Plus, uh, where we deliver impacts and deliver additional project work within the boundary of our current project um, that goes above and beyond the, the, the methodology requirements. Um, so uh, we've done, we're liaising with a, um, a rhino charity in Uganda um, to help rehabilitate or bring rhinos back into, into the wild. Uh, we're doing something similar in uh, Zambia, working with um, an elephant charity to help uh, reduce the human wildlife impact uh, in the project area because we found it was a really big problem of rhinos trampling on crops and uh, knocking down boreholes, quite frankly. So we're looking at ways to try and mitigate that. Um, we're also looking at uh, other project work, such as um, basket weaving workshops in Rwanda, working with women's groups, um, so they can create an additional uh, revenue within the project area. And our most recent project is in Burkina Faso, which uh, the, the problems they have, a lot of NGOs are running away. We stay put and are running a safe water project. And what we're finding is that a huge uh, issue that's facing the communities in terms of malnutrition of, of, of children. So um, we're looking, it's, it's got nothing to do with carbon, <laughs> but we're trying to bring it into carbon uh, and help support a feeding program um, to feed the children there. So we're using carbon finance as the vehicle to do more and have a deeper impact. Um, how that can be brought around a, a certification, I'm not 100% sure how it could be, um, but it's something that we we really like as a company it's it goes to the heart of, of who we are of, of doing the deeper impacts 
and what's great is that we're getting a lot more interest when we speak to people about this they are interested in these additional uh, projects within the carbon project boundary now if that could be uh, additionally certified like the the gender one uh, then, then that would be brilliant and I think that would just uh, help to um, generate even more uh, appetite thank you all right so I'm going to start turning to the audience. Now you heard from the four speakers and awesome work that the four organizations are doing. Any questions or comments? Or if you want to vote. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Yes. Hi. Hi, Paul. Um, Paul, uh, just to continue just last sentence, you said that there's interest in from buyers to invest or, or buy offsets from projects that have more than just the carbon, right? Paraphrase. My question is, do they pay more? Great question. Um, we are about to issue our uh, gender certified Uganda credits uh, just finished verification so they will issue in about a week's time so uh, they are available to sell so speak to me afterwards and then I'll perhaps I'll tell you whether they're willing to pay more or not um, <laughs> but uh, no in all seriousness um, uh, yes they are um, that's what we're finding um, so the um, we've already pre-sold some of our gender credits at a higher price than the Uganda one um, the uh, and we will be pushing out credits with additional project work uh, at a higher price but it's not about um, what we're seeing with our carbon plus concept it's not about us developing something it's about liaising and engaging with the corporate or with the client and say what do you want to achieve you know so here is our carbon project what are your sustainable development goals and what as a corporate are you trying to align against is it uh, supporting some kind of smallholder farming is it um, we're we'll be looking at offering projects based around uh, bee farming for the local community which obviously helps with the farming as well so we're looking at a, a dual blend basically projects where we've already done the activity looking for a higher price but also here's our carbon project and here's all the other stuff we can do what would you like to do how would you like to align it with your sustainable development goals how would you like to get your staff involved do you want to get you know, if you get your staff involved within your carbon management policy, it leads to a far better process and embeds high impact carbon within your carbon management policy. And it, it just, it's a much better way of doing it rather than just, oh yeah, we've ticked the box and we're carbon neutral. You know, get your team involved, get your whole corporate involved. Um, and we can do that through additional impacts. Faisal, you wanted to... Just, yeah, I mean, it's just a hypothesis right now. I mean, I think some of the other groups may have talked about it. Um, I mean, although we were in talking in jest, you know, farming, very high impact on livelihoods, large numbers of people mm -hmm. relying on agriculture. Um, and so there's, a, and cooking, similar things. And there's a reason for why in the voluntary carbon market, these are the two sectors that have had seen most steep growth in recent years. But it suggests something else. Like, for example, in the clean cooking market, that's about, say, 3 to 5% of the market, overall market, right? So you have to ask yourself, what is it, if you want volume, so if there are organizations who want carbon credits, you wouldn't come to clean cooking. So there must be something else that's driving your desire to want to come to clean cooking beyond carbon, right? Mm. So then that leads to a second level of kind of questions that actually if these existing standards allow us some way of valuing social impact, might we work towards looking at as carbon reductions go down and avoidance goes down, removals come up, that many of the reasons why people have come to where high impact sectors are, that somehow that is monetized and that there's a market for it. So can we create a market for social impact in much the way, same way the carbon market has developed a market for carbon uh, trading, right? So to us, that's a very interesting sort of future scenario. Yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Now, just to add, I mean, fair trade is also including the, the women impact, but we see that there is room for higher prices if you have a good story underneath the, your, your credits. And I fully support that. And I think we also need to 
to educate our clients a bit in what you buy if you buy something for two euro per ton, which is just ridiculous. If you look at the impact you, 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 you don't make with that two euro. So I think we need to work on our client base to, to give an idea what the impact is and what, well, 15 euro we sell for 15 and plus euro per ton. It's still too low. I mean, I would love to go to 50, like that like was said in the previous session, but let, let it end there with the financial impact. Huh? Let it go there. It's an interesting idea on impact uh, market beyond carbon. I think there's been a lot of talks around biodiversity markets, uh, uh, social outcome markets, adaptation market-based mechanisms. And, and I think one element that, because there, there are a lot of standards who can assess the impact but where's the demand coming from? I think that's gonna be an interesting uh, question for us to answer. And, and most of you interacting with the corporates and the buyers and the investors, maybe that's where the discussion needs to start because it's been discussed quite a lot and, and I'm quite curious to see how that evolves. Um, any other questions or comments? Uh, Jack Sutton, Agendi. Uh, I, I think it's a topic that we've been um, circling or that's been quite tangentially approached uh, throughout the different conferences. Um, and that's uh, specifically about what value could be built into credits uh, that's linked to basically adaptation, climate adaptation. A lot of the methodologies that have been discussed here, I guess this question would be mainly for NERA, uh, would be basically beneficial and have potentially quantifiable um, effects and gains in terms of climate adaptation for the communities where they're implemented. And today, do you see any way to measure these? And do you know who or how those could be valued, monetized, or basically leveraged? So basically, just to summarize, um, potential uh, as opposed to social co-benefits, adaptation co-benefits for carbon projects. Yeah, thank you for the question. And the adaptation in our projects is um, decided by the local groups. So we're not going to in induce how much they should do. I mean, I feel that uh, beyond carbon and the carbon savings, the adaptation uh, that we fund in our projects is not something we want to monetize because the women, they de decide what to do. And it feels a bit like over measuring everything. So I think we should also, if we talk about biodiversity improvement, I don't know if we need to quantify everything. I mean, we do a carbon credit, give a fair price, and they can invest in, in their environment how they s deem fit. So it feels a bit like a Western view to want to quantify everything. And I, that doesn't feel good for us because we're not the ones to decide and we're but of course, if you have more, uh, you can make pictures, you can show what you do with the adaptation or, or <coughs> biodiversity improvements. I think we, we don't go into that area, uh, despite that we want to be sure that the premium is used by the women in their best way. And it could be a borehole and it could be something else, but I'm not the one to decide that they have to plant so many trees because I want to get the carbon out of it. Yeah, you know, so tomorrow's Eid, big Muslim holiday, and you think about the things you're grateful for. And one of the things I'm grateful for is I didn't grow up in the carbon mar market. And therefore I can think straight. And I really, honestly. <laughs> and, and it's really, really straightforward for us, right? Someone talked about pricing. We operate on open book policy. So you're paying 80 bucks for our credit. This is how much we spent on those farms installing the hardware that you insisted we install. That's how much it cost. Whatever is left, the bulk of it is going to the, to the farmers and the rest we're keeping because we want to be a business. If we're investing tens of millions of dollars on farms, which is what we, what we are doing, uh, we want to make money. Otherwise, we'll have to go hand in hand to foundations and charities for three-year projects, which doesn't make any sense. Um, and you know, we've been doing this for 10 years. We've done you know, hundreds, and I say this very carefully, hundreds of social projects with smallholder farmers uh, across Asia. Healthcare projects, um, 
you know, many projects with, with women. We set up this thing called the, 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 the um, mother, uh, uh, community mother program. We saw lots of kids going into farms and everyone thought they'd come and they'd say, why are these kids working on farms? This is, you know, child labor. It wasn't child labor. It was because the moms had nowhere to leave them when they were going out. So we set up dozens and dozens of community uh, centers, where they, day, day centers, where they'd leave their, uh, their, their kids. They'd have sports and activity, et cetera. And everyone used to think we're crazy. They'd say, you're, you know, are you, are you a foundation? Are you a business? And now they call it co-benefits and they pay us more for it, which is great, you know. Um, but I, I think we should, everyone should operate on an open book basis and be totally transparent. The other secret, our secret, I'm going to share this with you because you're at the gold standard conference, is the key is never to take money out of the pockets of farmers when you introduce them to a pro anything. Mm -hmm. So you have these folks who drop out of Stanford, show up you know, in India and say, we have this new drone, it'll, it'll spray your farm and you're gonna make tons of money. But you have to pay for it first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where the conversation ends. And so our in principle is farmers pay nothing ever. We open bank accounts for them and they get US dollars wired straight to them. That's interesting. We, we, would, we would respectfully disagree with that approach. <laughs> we established that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We distort the market. Being a conservative politician, I'm surprised you would do that. <laughs> All right, we have a question. I think the small suggestions from uh, before we go back to Norway oh. and pump up more oil to pollute the rest of the world. So I think we could make a, I have a suggestion. All in this room, we make a kind of secret appointment who is transparent. Never sell a carbon credit under the price of $50 US dollar a ton. Then we can really make a change. Don't give it away for free because we, we need to make a change. Yeah. Good luck. That's an interesting conclusion from the session. Yeah. We make it a minimum, price. minimum price of $50. Thanks. And I guess this comment, more than a question, kind of comes out of that, that last statement about never selling a, a credit for, for less than $50. I mean, I, I really see that we've seen a lot of criticism, particularly on the nature space around methodologies or Red Plus and uh, uh, additionality, permanence, and all the rest of it, and, you know, sitting here. We've already made reference to where we're sitting multiple times already, right? Um, but what interests me around this is that I think that moving forwards, the major risks, particularly to purchasers and project developers, are going to come on the social side. And we've made good reference to this already from the panelists and how important that is. But and we, you know, everybody's looking for higher prices. They can deliver or they can uh, share more profit or revenues, whatever, with communities and the people who are actually changing things on the ground. But that is that everything comes with a trade off and distributing quite significant amounts of cash to people who don't maybe even have access to a bank account leads to quite significant changes in culture and um, the way in which many people can live their life. And so I think we also, one of the things which I think the standards agencies have to get on top of and, and, and consider very carefully as prices rise from you know, $2 a ton three years ago to we're discussing 50 to 80, what does that mean for a community and what does that mean in terms of the environmental and social impact that it will have? Because it does transform lives as you've mentioned. So I think that we also have to consider that this, is not this has huge positive effects but they also, the, they then have to be managed and they have to be monitored and we have to understand what that will then mean for that landscape moving forward because it can have very, very um, negative unintended consequences. So I would just issue caution on that view with regards to pricing and what that actually means for people in these landscapes. Mm. Yeah, I'm interested. Yeah. Um, well, I mean... Well, for instance, if it, I don't know if it's um, for if you think about a Red Plus project or something along those lines, people might decide, okay, well now uh, we know we have a project area here and we've protected the forest in this location, but maybe we've, we've now we've got a load of cash coming into our pockets. We want to um, uh, really move into quite 
extensive farming in another location, which is quite intensive. Um, or s something other, something else in, a, in another I've, way. I've so yeah. found a new friend of me. It's no longer you. It's him. <laughs> it's him. Uh, look, look. It's it's, it'll be a great problem to have. Yeah. Yeah, let, let, let you know when the when, you know if, if the problem we have is that that you know s these smallholder communities, these families have too much cash coming to them. Let's deal with that problem when it happens. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that. I think it's more complicated than you uh, outlined there. No, but I think you, you're partly. It's difficult to get a lot of funds to small communities. I agree with you, but it's not a reason not to do so. It's a reason to to be very um, well sh sharing. I think people know very well what they want to do with that money. They, they just have to get the time and the pace and the capacities to do so. So I feel that that there it should we should work on on the capacity to absorb the money of the carbon markets to improve their lives, and that is the, the reason of the whole carbon market to exist. So that's I don't see it as a risk, but it is a nice challenge. It's it's great to do that. That. Sorry, can I just respond as well, just to add um, to this point? I think. Um, you know, in terms of the, the studies that are, that are out there, in terms of what uh, the good things that happen with the cash transfers, you know, I think there's enough evidence to show that, you know, uh, people know how to allocate capital the best. And I think it's also got to do with whether, um, you know, the systems of governance that exist within a village or, or a community are good and basically are empowering people who haven't had a voice, you know, especially women. Uh, I think there are good chances that the money will be well spent, but I don't think, yeah, it's for us to sit here and say, oh, be careful, don't give them too much money, because, you know, so I think, yeah, we ha yeah, that's, yeah, my point. Um. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying I think we have to kind of think about what this might mean for these communities. And Please. it's not, yeah. Um, can we uh, get a question from the back? <laughs> Hello, um, this is Benia from Carbon Market Watch. I have a question that's um, moving away from this a bit, because I was I was interested in the stance of the of the panel speakers on interventions that are given for free and interventions that I've heard of that are actually creating a market. And um, yeah, just generally interested in what your stance on both of those approaches are. Uh, if a market can be established that can be sustainably used, we ought to be building a market, right? So uh, I think the point, I know we got into all these, uh, I think the point that was made by the conversation that happened is not about really not, don't give people enough money, but just be mindful of unintended consequences of what happens, right? So for example, um, you know, you may have a situation where you're giving away, say, 90%, except, or whatever, the bulk of the money, except the cost of capital and the risk that you take. That may be a fine approach, but then if there are others who are equally doing a similar product, then you're really creating a distortion in the market, right? So you've got to have a laying playing field. Uh, so it's not either or. There are certain circumstances where, for example, if there's no competition in that area, yeah, I, I suppose you could possibly do something without creating distortions. But generally, it's not wise in, in, in our perspective to try and just you know, give things away for free because people just have to own it. And then there's a link between the company and the user as well because once you give it away, there's no nothing that supposes that you're going to go there and keep servicing the customer. Mm -hmm. right? So it's... Yeah. Just one example concrete in Rwanda where we work and we do the, the women eh, talking about market distortion, they, they purchase the stove, but they get a cash revenue, a cash back based on their cook stove usage. So they get a premium and the carbon revenue is channeled back to them mm. to purchase pellets. So then it is deducted. So in that sense, they benefit not at the moment of the purchase of the stove, but later on in the process in the value chain when they purchase pellets. So that's not market distortion, but it is um, w it is benefit sharing as well. It's both 
you know, the methodologies that, that we use have been around for 30 years, deeply rooted in science. They just haven't been adopted at all. And one of the reasons is our farmers are very, very poor and can't afford the hardware. And so we would love to be in a place where everyone is able to afford it. But until that time, we will buy it, we will install it, and we'll take the risk. Great. That, <laughs> I was going to say that, but uh, all right, let's take one more question. And then we'll, we'll need to close. Okay, mine is not actually a question. Uh, I'm Aaron uh, from Fall Alliance, uh, born. Just about the unintended consequences. I just want to say one practical thing <laughs> that we have found um, which works, that if you trust the governance structures with the smallholder communities, they are able to make decisions that will surprise you. And we have development and, and funding going into improving uh, provision of uh, school uniforms for their children. You know, they find a way to distribute to make sure every household has all that their children need for school, for books, you know, and they set up their own hospitals. They are able to pay for field officers to come and help them enhance their work. So um, there is nothing like unintended consequences. I mean, if you're thinking you're living in uh, maybe uh, some area in, in England and somebody gives you a lot of money, you might want to go and buy a big car and you know flash around, but they think of the practical things that would enhance the lives of the next generation. And so we should have confidence in the communities. I'm an African, I can say that for sure. And I've seen that happen from the work that Follians does. Thank you. Thank you very much for that final comment. All right, so that brings us to the end. Thank you very much for a very exciting discussion. So let's thank the panelists.